So for this part of the module, we're going to review just questions that overall review vector change and apply to different clinical circumstances. So for the first question, can vector change be performed in patients under 18 years old? So obviously we have to like adhere to the AHA guidelines and the ILCOR guidelines. And vector change is only recommended for those patients 18 years and older, because truly that's what the study population has been done in. So you can't kind of translate that information to the pediatric population for obvious reasons. So currently we cannot do vector change defibrillation for someone who's less than 18 years old. Should we start with the anterior posterior pad placement? So standard defibrillation hits the largest portion of our myocardium. So that vast majority of the time should be sufficient to hopefully convert them. However, again, survivability drops quite dramatically after the third defibrillation. At that point, it's probably a, por a problem with the bottom left portion of the ventricle. So just doing that vector change will allow, hopefully, to depolarize that portion of the heart. Can we apply a vector change for three defibrillations throughout the cardiac arrest, even if they're not consecutive? So this time, no. They have to be in refractory ventricular fibrillation or pulsus ventricular tachycardia, which means three consecutive shocks. If patients are in like sporadic shockable rhythms, you can still give them antiarrhythmics if you're an ACP crew and def standard defibrillation. Do we need to patch the perform a vector change? So the easy answer is no. This is not a delegated controlled act. You can perform vector change, you don't have to do a patch, and once it's in place, you keep the new pad placement in, in the present spot, you don't change it early transport of vector change. So this is a great question that has come up because especially for PCPs, it says you should consider early transport for patients in refractory ventricular fibrillation or pulses ventricular tachycardia because they potentially need antiarrhythmics, other therapies that maybe we cannot provide in the pre-hospital setting. But if we know there could be a possible increase of patients converting if we do a vector change, you could do that. There is no like gold standard rule. And you think about logistically too, like you have to put the patient on the scoop potentially or a backboard and logistically it just makes sense to put on the new set of pads and tier posterior location. So it's beneficial to do the vector change as early as possible because that's what Dr. Cheska's and other literature has reviewed. The earlier you do vector change and more aggressive you do these therapies can potentially increase survivability. Can we count public access defibrillations and or the fire department's defibrillations towards our vector chains? So these answers is up to you at this time because sometimes you may not count them, some other times you do count them because they should be sophisticated monitors. And if the fire department's like, listen, we've defibrillated twice, then you apply your pads, you confirm they're in a shockable rhythm. It's like they've defibrillated this patient three consecutive times after our defibrillation now. It's like, Maybe we should try a vector change, but it all depends on the pad placement, how comfortable you are with the story and incident history. And overall, you can just make the decision based on the clinical circumstances and just document why or why didn't you do it. Because again, we don't have a medical directive at this point in time to do vector change. It's just education to support why this could be beneficial and it may come in the near distance future. Mm -hmm.